Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Anthony De Niro. I mean, he's so blatantly stupid. He's a punk. He's a dog. He's a pig. He's a con, a bullshit artist, a mutt who doesn't know what he's talking about, doesn't do his homework, doesn't care, thinks he's gaming society, doesn't pay his taxes. He's an idiot. Colin Powell said it best. He's a national disaster. He's an embarrassment to this country. It makes me so angry that this country has gotten to this point, that this fool, this bozo, has wound up where he has. He talks how he wants to punch people in the face. Well, I'd like to punch him in the face. This is somebody that we want for president? I don't think so. What I care about is the direction of this country. And what I'm very, very worried about is that it might go in the wrong direction with someone like Donald Trump. If you care about your future, vote for it. Okay, so very strong but true words. Obviously, that's De Niro talking about the fat orange Joffrey from this weekend. So hello and welcome to episode 35 of Skeptic Smash Talk. I'm your host, Jason Jones, and I am once again flying solo tonight, I'm sorry to say. And is down with the flu, and we've had some other things to deal with this weekend. So she is having a more than deserved rest. But Andy and I have just got back from Greece, and I want to say it was a well-deserved holiday. But I have a little bit of guilt still in saying that when you consider all the other rubbish that's going on around the world. But really, we needed the rest. And yes, the money could have been used better, but anybody that knows the year that Andy and I have had will give us a pass on that. Oh, and when I say rest, that is exactly what we did. Apart from one day when we ventured down about three miles down the road to a little cafe that, well, to be honest, we really only did that to check if they still had the tortoises wandering around the front of the place uh, from last time we were there. And just down the road from there, there's a little beach bar that I fondly remember has probably the best beer in Corfu if not around the Mediterranean. Apart from that, we literally didn't venture out of the hotel. Each day was basically wakey-wakey about 8am, breakfast at 9, a stroll down the hill to the beach to feed the fishes that, amazingly, were not shy of the 22 stone monster lurking in their water, then back up the hill for a few rounds of table tennis. And when I say table tennis, it was more like hitting the ball as friendly and softly and slowly as possible so that neither of us had to bend over to pick it up. The bar opened at about 10.30, so it was cocktails and iced coffee by the pool until lunchtime, which consisted mostly of soup and salad because I'm watching my figure. But as we were in the Mediterranean, we were obliged to have an afternoon nap, followed by a pre-dinner cocktail, followed by dinner, followed by post-dinner cocktails. And we repeated that six times and then come on home. And I swear to Thor, that is exactly what happened. And the next person that tells me my life is not fulfilled because I don't have children's or animals in the house will hear that story. And as I think about it, I sort of feel less guilty. We do so much each day. Andy and I both work full time, then at about 20 hours of working on this podcast and other production work that I do, and uh, we have a house and ourselves to take care of, and ourselves is something that's been neglected. After I got injured last year, I went from running nearly 80 miles a week and cycling 200 miles a week to hardly being able to walk. So I've gained about 85 pounds. But now that I'm 98% repaired again, I need to get that weight off before my heart or my pancreas gives out. So at another 20 hours a week of training, I'll probably do a few more extra subjects this year with edX, so say another 10 hours a week for studying. All I can do is thank fuck that I have chronic insomnia or else I'll get nothing done. So yes, it is important to have a rest. But when we got home on Friday, we found out that a family member had died the day before we returned. Our family held back telling us this until we got home because they knew how devastating the news was going to be, especially for Andy. 
So then when I think I feel just a little bit guilty of going away and splurging my hard-earned cash on a Greek island and eating and drinking and playing whiff waff between naps, I push the guilt away because I was there with my best mate, the person I share every day with, the person who I talk to on the phone every day when we're at work, the person that makes me who I am, the person that one day won't be there to comfort me on the day that I need comforting the most. So I'm not going to feel guilty for spending a week on an island disconnected from the world, not thinking about work, not thinking about the trolls and the clowns and the trumps and the evil that's going on, not thinking about how much pain I'm in, not thinking about when I talk into this microphone, I don't say something that doesn't offend anyone that I don't actually want to be offensive to. I spent a week thinking about my wife and my home and me and it's the best week I've had in a very long time. We don't get a lot of time on this insignificant fleck of dust that's hurtling through the universe. Not a lot of time at all. So let's make the most of the time that we do get. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. I can do anything. You know what? I don't even know the best place to start anymore with Trump. Do we talk about him wanting to shag his daughter? Do we talk about him for some reason thinking he's running a campaign against Bill Clinton, not Hillary? Do we talk about the foul stun where he created a press conference and gathered a group of women that have each accused Bill Clinton of rape? The list of horrific acts that this glow-in-the-dark ass clown has done just this week alone are mind-blowing. Okay, before we go too far, let's clear one thing up first. Wilf, or at Enraged Wills on Twitter, tweeted or tweeted or twatted, whatever it is you do when someone tweets you a message. Anyway, he asked, when was the last time that Dum Dum didn't win Thunder Cunt of the Month? Well, The fact of the matter is, he actually hasn't had the honour, and I'm not too sure that I'll actually give it to him. Do you want to know why? Well, this month, the Thunder Cum of the Month was awarded to a hamburger. Yeah, you heard that right. A hamburger beat Donald Trump to the most exclusive award that some fat, arrogant Australian living in the UK talking trash about American politics can award. It's apparently even a true honour just to be nominated. That's how much of a loser Dum Dum is. He's been bested by a fucking hamburger. Anyway, to the vileness that's come out of his mouth this week. Well, actually, this first one, you all know where I'm going with it, don't you? I've just played a little bit. Anyway, this misogynistic vomit fell out of his word hole in 2005 when he was caught on a hot mic when he was talking to Billy Bush. And that's a whole story in itself. Apart from everyone going apeshit and trying to blame Billy Bush for what dumbass had said, anyway, if you're not a fan of uh, shitty paparazzi-style TV shows, Billy Bush is, or was at the time, the host of Access Hollywood, the epitome of shitty paparazzi-style TV shows. But what's very ironic is that Billy Boy is the nephew of George H.W. Bush, which, if I remember my genealogy right, makes him the cousin of George W. Bush and also Jeb Bush, the spectacular spectacularly failed GOP candidate from the last run of Bush clowns to the White House. And I can't overemphasize how spectacular Jeb failed. And credit where it's due, Trump spanked him like a naughty little schoolboy. And so if the pundits are right, if these recordings are the beginnings of what will bring the fat orange Joffrey down, you know the headlines are going to read, with irony even Alanis Morissette will get right, along the lines of a Bush trumps the Donald, or even something less side-splittingly funny than that. Anyway, if you want to take the nation's temperature on such matters, of course we must turn to the social networks. And the best place to play a round of whack a troll is Twitter. And they have been out as thick as themselves this weekend. But what's got me absolutely dumbfounded is the amount and the veracity that people are still supporting him. And yeah, you guessed it, they're making excuses for him. 
And this frightens me because it mirrors the clowns that supported and still support Farage and Boris. And I don't want to get too far off track, and I've mentioned this before, but from the morning of the announcement of the Brexit result, it seemed that a certain section of the population, let's just call them the far right white, decided that the results gave them permission to act on their xenophobia and bigotry. Even just this weekend, there were more announcements with statistics that show homophobic hate crime has shot up nearly 150% with direct links to Brexit. And race and hate crime is still increasing. And don't be like the fucktards that are saying it's got nothing to do with Brexit. This is real. The Polish guy that was stabbed a few weeks ago, the prick that cut him said it was because we voted to get the immigrants out. And that's what the far white right actually think the vote was about. The voters don't even care about EU regulations. And they must have known that the $350 million on the side of the battle bus was bullshit. The Brexit result was purely and simply about immigration, bigotry and hate. And do you think this won't happen in America? If the horrific happens and Trump gets a nod... You've seen the inbreds at his rallies. I've played some of his clips. I played some last week. Better yet, stop listening to me and have a look at the Young Turks politics on YouTube. Just search the Young Turks politics. And they have interviewed the crowds at his rallies. Why do you think he always scheduled them in towns where baby sheep have more front teeth than the entire audience and the banjo factory is desperate for machine operators with more than three fingers? Have a look at the morons that try and troll me on Twitter, like the runner-up for Cock Cheese of the Year, at Vosnik, and that's at V-O-S-N-I-C, who after trying to argue that Bill Clinton, who I tried to assure Vosnik, was not running for POTUS several times, did worse things than what Trump has done. Finally, this idiot showed his true colours when he tweeted, all I need to know is Trump actually likes America and won't sell whites down the river to get illegals and Muslims votes. And let's look at that. Let's just put the blatant bigotry aside for a second. Now, I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure illegal immigrants can't vote. They need to register, and being that all the parties and Hillary, and to be fair, both sides are all about the minority voter suppression. So you know if there's a way to stop the minorities from voting, they have it covered. But it's the second part that speaks volume for the attitude of the dumb shits like at Vosnik. The comments about Muslim votes, does he think that a Muslim vote is not as worthy as Snow White's vote? Does that remind you of something? Does that remind you of the three-fifths compromise at all? That was when a Negro slave was counted as three-fifths of a human being for population purposes. I wonder how at Vosnik, and that's at V-O-S-N-I-C, feels about the Jews or the natives or the Hindus. Go back and have a look. He was fairly clear about how he felt about atheists. And come to think of it, I'm pretty sure that the likes of At Vosnik and his fellow trumpeteers would prefer that only white men get a vote anyway. Make America great again. Anyway, and if you think that's as bad as Twitter gets, well, come on, you know me better than that. When I asked Numbnuts here if guys were talking about scoring with his wife... Was that okay? Is that just guy talk? Was it okay for a guy to say, I'm going to grab your pussy? And at Vosnik, at V-O-S-N-I-C, replied, yes. And I'm paraphrasing a little, but Trump said that he can walk up and grab a handful of pussy whenever he wants because he's rich. He can slip in the Tic Tac and stick his vile old man tongue in any woman's mouth and he doesn't have to ask. Thundercum is an understatement. And when Trump and his Cheeto-stained followers chant Make America Great Again, you know what they really want. They really want to make America 1950 again. Make America a place where women don't have rights. And if you're rich or famous, you can grab a married woman's pussy and do what the fuck you want. Make America Great Again. Do this for me. Indulge me. Close your eyes and imagine you're in a village in a war-ravaged country. Let's call it, I don't know, Iraq. You don't know what the fuck's going on. You don't get news that's not filtered by the government. 
you don't have an iPad or a phone that's been upgraded since the Nokia 3210. All of a sudden, you find out that the person running for leader of the free world, this big fat orange oompa loompa, is going to expel anyone that is not the same skin color as him or believes in the same God as him. And he's going to force immigrants from other countries to build his walls and defenses. I could go on and on and on. Everything this fucktard has said in all its madness, that villager in the war-torn Middle Eastern hellhole is going to think Saddam Hussein wasn't bad after all. Okay, I got off point. I said about the change in behaviour after Brexit from the far white right. Will the same thing happen in the USA? Well, from the outside looking in, America is a powder keg right now just waiting for a spark. Think about it. Every few weeks, we hear about yet another unarmed black man being killed by the people that are supposed to be protecting him. And I'm not making a judgment call on that. Not right now anyway. I'm pointing out a fact. And then you have the Islamophobia that's becoming a pandemic. A guy was kicked off yet again a flight last week for saying inshallah or God willing. He said one fucking word. The passenger, as it turned out, come to the US in 2010 as an Iraqi refugee. I lived under Saddam Hussein. I know what discrimination feels like, he said. He had made a brief call to his uncle in Baghdad, telling him how excited he was to have been able to ask a question to the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, during a dinner the previous day. He was escorted off the plane and asked by an agent why he was speaking in Arabic, considering today's political climate. Land of the free, my fucking ass. Don't look different. Don't read different. Don't whatever the fuck you do, do complex math if you look and sound different on the plane. But most importantly, don't call your family in a strange language about the pride you're feeling after having dinner with Ban Ki-moon. And I'll move on from this in a moment, but this is important. The phrase, inshallah, for Muslims they are told that they should never say that they will do a particular thing in the future without adding inshallah to the statement. It's as common as a full stop at the end of a sentence. But Dum Dum, and he's not alone in this, but he and his ilk have made a significant proportion of America fear anyone that looks or sounds Arabic. He's infecting the country with a disease, and it's a disease called xenophobia. So here we are. You have African Americans living in fear and learning to fear authority. You have Arabic Americans living in fear and learning to fear everybody. You have Hispanic Americans living in fear that the giant orange Joffrey is going to use them as indentured servants to build his wall. And you have the credulous Americans that believe every piece of foul bullshit that comes out of his vomit hole and they're the ones you need to worry about you need to worry about the racists and the biggest and the misogynists and the cowards that hide behind trump they will let trump say the vile things that they are thinking and that they have been thinking for so long but have been too yellow belly to say out in public until now my real fear and this has just hit me now like a ton of bricks No matter what the result, no matter what happens, the gates of the cunt farm have been opened and you can't close it, not before Bedlam. If Trump wins, as it happened here with Brexit, it will be seen as permission to act out. If he loses, his minions will be outraged and it will be seen as permission to act out. So did you ever think you would hear me open the story with the following headlines. Clowns who terrify children are warned that they face arrest. Or, in another headline, police issue warnings that people dressing as clowns may be committing public order offences. Now, I hate clowns as much as the next man, 
especially that one with the red afro and the burgers. But this is just madness personified. What I really want to do is have a good old laugh at what should be just a funny situation. But I'm actually worried that somebody's going to get hurt or worse. Maybe not so much here in the UK, but for fuck's sake, there's nearly 300 million firearms in the USA. And I take it under advisement that most gun owners are responsible gun owners. Well, maybe not those ones that are showing up at the Trump rallies after they've finished their job at the banjo factory. But anyway, what we have are some clowns, literally, for some reason that nobody actually really knows why and how it all started. And Hopefully, for the most part, they're just having a bit of a giggle. But then there are the dumbasses that have taken it to the next level. If you remember a few weeks back, I talked about the rise of online trolls and how they felt that as an avatar, they could do whatever they want. Mostly, probably because of games like Grand Theft Auto. And don't write in, I'm not wrong on this. This is something that somebody is actually doing a PhD on. These are facts. Anyway, it looks like. The trolls are taking it to the next level and trolling in real life, albeit under a mask and quite aptly the mask of a clown. But this is not just happening in America. It's becoming a worldwide epidemic. And where everybody thinks this happened was in Greenville, South Carolina in August. Well, it was actually the 21st of August this year. There was an alleged clown sighting in Greenville, South Carolina, at the Fleetwood Manor apartment complex. Children in the complex reportedly witnessed clowns or a group of clowns attempting to talk to the children. These kids told their parents that the clowns had flashing green laser lights and said they lived in an abandoned house in the woods near a small lake. Greenfield police came to the complex to investigate and did find a trail in the woods leading to a house and a small lake, but there was no evidence of clowns or clown paraphernalia. And while some of these reports have been harmless, other reports have been more suspicious. In one instance, a woman reported a person in a clown costume standing in her backyard who ran away as she took a picture. In one case, an individual had heard clanging chains and banging noises at his front door, while other cases, there's reports of clowns offering money or candy to children to follow the clown into the woods, which, of course, is fucking creepy, which leads to things like this. After an alleged clown sighting at University Park just last week, Penn State students gathered together for a clown hunt. Reports say that the number of students attending this hunt ranged from 500 to 1,000. Following the hunt, the police stated that they did not believe that there were any actual clown sightings. But thankfully, they also said that there was no property damage, no injury, or no violence. But very closer to my home, the copycats are right at it too. So much so that the Greater Manchester Police have turned to Twitter. They posted yesterday... In their words, an idiot in a clown mask leaning out of a white van shouting at passers-by. Van had got mug guards. But that's not as bad as a Facebook group that's appeared claiming to do a so-called clown attack on five high schools in the Manchester area. That's probably all just macho bullshit talk, but this is the same area, the very same area that were affected by those riots a few years back that was very well publicised on on Facebook. So you can imagine why people are a little on edge, especially when you hear reports like from County Durham where four kids aged 11 and 12 were chased by a clown with a knife on their way to school. Now, luckily here in the UK, we have pretty strict gun laws. But imagine this scenario in any town USA where there are more guns than citizens. Four 11 and 12-year-olds running and screaming from a knife-wielding clown is not going to end well. And like I say, nobody really knows where this all started. There's some suggestions that it was a publicity stunt for either a Stephen King movie or the new Rob Zombie movie, but I doubt that anyone will want to admit any responsibility for this. But it looks like someone, hopefully with good intentions, albeit just as moronic as a killer clown craze itself, has started a Clown Lives Matter movement. 
and they're planning a rally in Tucson for 15 October, so that's next Saturday. According to a flyer advertising the event, this is a peaceful way to show clowns are not psycho killers. We want the public to feel safe and not be afraid. So come out and bring the family, meet a clown, and get a hug. More than 100 clowns are expected to show up, and the attendees are invited to participate in full clown makeup. And you know what? I am literally lost for words. I know you have come to expect a very witty closure to each story I do, but honestly, I'm lost for words. I know it's a mathematically impossibility, but we have fuckwits squared. The fuckwits dressed as clowns trying to scare and intimidate children, and then we have the fuckwits using the same name of a movement that was started to highlight the murder of innocent and unarmed African-American boys in an attempt to get the masses into the streets to celebrate clown pride. Honestly, speechless. Okay, so let's have a look at a few news stories. This first one comes from, well, actually, just about everywhere where all good scientific press releases are copied verbatim. So we'll just give credit for this one to The Independent and The Guardian. And it's an interesting story, not for what it tells us, but for what we can learn about scientific reporting and how we read scientific reporting. But the story reads, A mother's genetics determines how clever her children are, according to researchers, and the father makes no difference. Women are more likely to transmit intelligent genes to their children because they are carried on the X chromosome and women have two of these, while men have an X and a Y chromosome. But in addition to this, scientists now believe genes for advanced cognitive functions, which are inherited from the father, may be automatically deactivated. A category of genes known as condition genes are thought to work only if they come from the mother in some cases and the father in other cases. Intelligence is believed to be among the condition genes that have come from the mother. Laboratory studies using genetically modified mice found that those with an extra dose of maternal genes developed bigger heads and brains but had smaller bodies. Those with an extra dose of paternal genes had smaller brains and larger bodies. Okay, so the story goes on a little bit there, but I want to stop and cut to the chase. Normally, well, recently, it's become normal for people to get to this paragraph and stop. They say, oh, it's in mice, not in humans. And yes, there are good reasons for doing this. Mice are obviously different from humans. But for initial research, they're a brilliant analog, especially for genetics, because we can breed many generations of mice fast with the potential to actually breed eight generations down the same line in 12 months. That's not my point, though. Because much smarter and more cherished podcasters than me start with an interesting story like this and then spend longer than they need to ripping it apart or ripping apart the methodology of the study or dismissing the findings as it's a phase one trial or, like I said, scrubbing it out because it's a rodent trial, we listeners tend to form a Pavlovian response when we're reading studies or the results of studies or articles when we hear certain words. In this case, when we hear mice, rather than start salivating like Pavlov's hound, we probably groan or regurgitate something that one of the so-called elite skeptics have said about mice and feel quite proud of ourselves. But what you need to do is finish reading the article and then make an informed decision for yourself. And then groan and roll your eyes in derision if need be. We need to get past the third or fourth paragraph. Because as is the case in this story, there may be a little more to learn. So let's continue. Concerned that people might not be like mice, researchers in Glasgow took a more human approach to exploring intelligence. They found the theories extrapolated from mice studies did bear out in reality 
when they interviewed 1,206,086 ,006 young people between the ages of 14 and 22 every year from 1994. And for anyone that's into data sets, that is phenomenal. Anyway, despite taking into account several factors from the participants' education to their race and socioeconomic status, the team still found that the best predictor of intelligence was the IQ of the mother. However, research also makes it clear that genetics are not the only determinant of intelligence. Only 40 to 60% of intelligence is estimated to be from hereditary, leaving a similar chunk of dependence on the environment. That being said, mothers have also been found to play an extremely significant role in this non-genetic part of intelligence, with some studies suggesting a secure bond between the mother and child is intimately tied to intelligence. Researchers at the University of Washington found that a secure emotional bond between the mother and a child is critical for the growth of some of the parts of the brain. And after analysing the way a group of mothers related to their children for seven years, the researchers found children who were supported emotionally had their intellectual needs fulfilled had a 10% larger hippocampus at 13, on average, than children whose mothers were emotionally distant. The hippocampus is the area of the brain associated with memory. The hippocampus is an area of the brain associated with memory. The hippocampus, okay, that's a bad joke. Anyway, the hippocampus is the area of the brain associated with memory, learning, and stress response. A strong bond with the mother is thought to give a child a sense of security which allows them to explore the world and the confidence to solve problems. In addition, devoted and attentive mothers tend to help children solve problems, further helping them to reach their potential. Okay, so I touched on this earlier uh, when talking about Donald Trump, but this is again all over just about everywhere but the story is about the increase of homophobic attacks now in the uk it's been reported that homophobic attacks have risen by 147 percent in the three months following the brexit vote according to figures compiled by an lgbt anti-violence charity group called gallup they have said the number of hate crime incidents in July, August and September following the referendum vote was up 147% on the corresponding three months of 2015. The figures add to concerns that the hatred seen after the Brexit vote, which led to an immediate 57% rise in hate crime, across the board, as reported to the police, was not restricted to racial or religious hostilities. Now, these incidents were reported, and, and the researchers collected them uh, from the three sites, and um, there's Post, Ref, Racism, War Insides, and I Street Watch, and I'll put those links in the show notes so you can have a look. But one of the incidents included a crowd that was walking down Jury Lane in London two days after the referendum results, shouting, first we get the polls out, then the gays. There was a report of a Romanian lesbian being attacked in Oxford and suggested that the incident shown strains of the 1930s Germany. The broad range of groups being targeted after the Brexit vote was also revealed by the fact that while 51% of abusers specifically mentioned the referendum, the most commonly targeted ethnic group was in fact people of South Asia rather than European origin. And the statistics compiled by Gallup suggest that LGBT people also become the targets of a minority who felt emboldened by the referendum result to express their long-simmering hatred, because in one researcher's words, it made them think that everybody agrees with them now. Does that feel like deja vu? Did I not say that not 20 minutes ago? And it doesn't get any better. The report also noted that when it comes to the last hate crime the respondents had experienced, half of those who reported it to the police felt dissatisfied with the outcome. 
This compares poorly, they say, with other types of crimes. A quarter of the respondents said that in future, they probably will not report any hate crime they experience, with 44% of them explaining that they felt it would not be taken seriously. One bisexual man told the researchers, imagine if in a year's time I get beaten up again. Do you think they will believe me if I report it? He said, I don't think so. I don't think they will go after the perpetrators. I don't think anything will happen. Now, the chief executive from Gallup said in The Guardian, the UK response to hate crime are amongst the best in the world. But our hate crime laws are far from perfect. The highest prison sentence a court can give for a homophobic or transphobic or disability common assault is six months. But compare that to the two-year maximum sentence to a race or faith-based common assault. So a tip for the bigots here, if you see a gay one-legged Eskimo that you feel may not know that they are different and strange and icky, and maybe you think you need to teach them a lesson, for fuck's sake, don't mention they're an Eskimo. You'll save yourself 18 months at Her Majesty's pleasure. How was that right? How do you measure the level of hate crime like that? Okay, well, that's a little bit of a rhetorical question. We barely have same-sex marriage rights, so I think we just need to keep going with the baby steps. Anyway, I'll close off with this, and I'll say it again. Please, 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 America, learn from what happened here. Win, lose, or draw, your presidential results will cause bedlam. If Trump wins, it will be the same as it is here. It will be seen as a sign of authority to act in a way that they have had to have kept hidden away. Dum Dum has already told his minions to get out on voting day and take note of who is voting. Look at them, he said, planting the confirmation bias seed perfectly. But if, or really I should say when, Trump gets his saggy, gingered-haired ass handed to him on a shit-smeared plate, his far-right white supporters are going to be looking for revenge. And you know, we all fucking know, when he concedes, he will blame the them. It's the them that he told his minions to watch out for. He was cheated, he will say. It was rigged, he will say. All by them. The ones he planted the bias seeds in their heads. And I honestly don't think he has the smarts to conjure this up by himself. But Roger Ailes does for sure. Just plant the seed. You don't have to tell the far right white who the them are. Because it's everyone that's not the far right white. It's them, the Mexicans. It's them, the Muslims. It's them, the blacks. And it's them, the Asians. It will be bedlam. And this is just one thing I really want to be wrong about. Okay, hang in there. We are nearly done. This last story comes from, again, just about everywhere, but the main source for, were from Voltface and The Independent, and it reads, Relationship partners who take MDMA together enter a bubble where they feel free to express their deepest emotions, and the drug could be used for therapy within 10 years, an expert has told The Independent. A study into the use of the drug used by couples has suggested it can help them discuss their issues free of fear. Talking about everything from sexual fantasies and infidelity to difficult memories. According to Katie Anderson, a doctoral researcher in applied sciences at London South Bank University. Now, within what Anderson calls the MDMA bubble, couples reported that otherwise difficult conversations felt organic and natural and that they understood their partner on a deeper level. There was some extraordinary experience where the sense of closeness MDMA created was so profound that the most fundamental boundaries of all was blurred, that between self and other, she says. We are not two people, we are one person, a couple told her. Another pair described taking MDMA in the bath and now the dimly lit watery surroundings seemed to perpetuate a fluidity of selves. It felt like we were fused together. Like one piece, another couple said. Both male and female participants reported that men were more emotionally vulnerable 
and open on the drug. The feelings of the bubble lingered after the drug wore off too, explains Anderson, as they were reminded of their experiences. The drug created a nice clean slate, one parent said. While some were worried that they were developing a chemical romance, they found that the feelings of closeness remained. Now, to make her findings for the initial study, Anderson asked couples aged between 24 and 60 years old who had taken MDMA together five times or more to describe how the experience influenced their relationship. The first stage involved interviewing 10 couples and the second stage involved diaries and individual interviews. MDMA, which can be taken as a powder or a pill, is a synthetic psychoactive drug which triggers parts of the brain linked with the happiness and euphoria and also boosts energy levels. Most significant for this study, though, it is also boosts empathy. Now, the problem is MDMA is illegal and it can be cut with harmful substances when bought on the street. It also affects the body's temperature controls, meaning that some people, although generally only those who are not properly informed to the risk and precautions, can become dehydrated or drink dangerously high amounts of water. And that's normally the tragic stories you hear on the news. More times than not, the death was caused by overhydration than dehydration. Anyway, continuing on, Anderson is among researchers working to understand how pure laboratory-controlled psychoactive drugs could be used for therapy. Last year, the USDEA approved the use of MDMA by the non-profit Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS, in a study into post-traumatic stress disorder. Anderson says, in 10 years' time, no one will bat an eyelid if you are to say that you're going to an MDA-assisted psychotherapy session. The scientific evidence is building for both the safety and the efficacy of these therapies, and the public will respond to that. Polls already suggest that public opinion on the regulation of other drugs such as cannabis has shifted with 47% in favour of sale from licensed premises. But Anderson added that a stigma around such research remains and referred to former government advisor Professor David Nutt needing to crowdfund £50,000 to complete a study into LSD brain imaging. Anderson closes with, I'd like to see this stigma fade so that we can conduct the research needed to give us real evidence-based pictures about the true potential and value and harm of such illicit drugs. And why not? Now, I'm no expert in relationships or marriages, but I've been married three times. So I reckon if I put my honesty goggles on, communication is probably the number one failure point in relationships. Okay, so when it comes to infidelity, I don't really know if being open and honest about it afterwards will change the results. But I can imagine if one partner found out that they were attracted to somebody else, talking about it up front may save some of the savagery. But I think the key communication failure is when it comes to sexual fantasies. The researchers talked about removing the stigma of certain drugs, but what about the stigma of sexual fantasies and desires as well? We never talk about them because they're very personal, and we may have a fear that when a guy, for instance, tells his wife that he wants to be pegged with a strap-on, she may think him a little odd. Oh, by the way, according to one survey in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, This is a very common fantasy. But some of the others may also surprise you. Of the uh, 717 men in this particular study, 88.7% said that they were heterosexual, 1.5% said that they were gay, and 9.8% said that they were bisexual. But nearly 27% of all male participants said that they fantasized about giving oral sex to a man. And 21% of all male participants said that they fantasize about having sex with another man. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but I wonder how many of these participants would openly say this to their partners. And of course, the ones that you'd expect to be up high in the ranks, like threesomes and having sex with a celebrity or in public, 
And if you want to invoke Donald Trump's locker room, these fantasies are common parlance, even in a mixed crowd. But what about this? And to be clear, these are just fantasies. These aren't actual events. But 65% of men fantasized about getting a hand job off a workmate or friend. And 62% of them fantasized about getting a hand job off a stranger. And 45% of men said that they have fantasized about having sex involving two or more men, compared to 30% of women. Now, I could go on, and I'll put the links in the show notes. The study is phenomenal, but I'm missing the point. Um, and I said it before, what I'm trying to get across is that these are fantasies, not actualities. And to a large extent, the availability of the very strange stuff on the internet is making the list bigger. Now, I dare you to search for blue people porn or crazy clown gay sex. They exist. I can tell you that for a fact. Still not my point, though. What I'm trying to get across is that there is no need to be embarrassed about fantasies or actualities for that matter. Sex is a massive part of relationships and it's a massive reason for the end of them as well. If it takes something like MDMA to get people to open up and talk about it, then fuck it. Literally, let's do it. Because the survey also revealed that men were much more likely to make their fantasies a reality. So is this a problem? Well, that really depends on the individuals and the types of relationship they're in. But let's play out this scenario. Now, this is just for the men, because the women listening to this are much smarter than us, and they already know this. But let's imagine that you're a happily married guy, everything is fine and dandy, but you've always fantasized about Smurfette. And come on, admit it. Who hasn't? I bet half of you listening right now have smurfed your smurf to Katy Perry, voicing Smurfette, you smurfing fucking smurfs. <laughs> oh, sorry, everyone. A little bit sidetracked there. Anyway, so... No, let's be serious again. So, you have this thing, and you're too ashamed to tell your wife that you don't collect the Smurf figurines for investment purposes. It just turns out that that's your thing. So, you head off to Comic-Con one day, and you happen to meet somebody dressed as Smurfette. This person also has a fantasy. She likes short, fat, horseshoe bald, middle-aged men with grey, oily ponytails that collect Smurf figurines and hang out at Comic-Cons. One thing leads to another, and you end up smurfing her brains out. And the next day, you go home feeling blue. Literally, because you didn't wash all the body paint off your cock. And look, to be clear, in over 90% of cases where a sexual fantasy does transform into reality, It's a one-time thing only. And I don't know if it's because it relates to infidelity or not, so the fantasy is lost in guilt, or it just wasn't as it was expected, but not more than 90% of realized fantasies are one-time events only. Now, the most common reason for divorce or long-term relationship breakdown is infidelity. Now, I don't know how far the MDMA search will go, but if couples can find a way to communicate their fantasies, surely it stands to reason that there may just be some common ground. If we go back to some research, 82% of men and women fantasize about having sex in unusual places. About the same amount fantasize about having sex outside. 72% of men and women fantasize about masturbating or being masturbated during sex and the same amount fantasize about having sex with somebody that's not their partner and 55 percent of people fantasize about having sex with somebody famous and now you don't have to be a mathematical genius to work this out for yourself take the first two eight out of ten people fantasize about having sex outside and in an unusual place. While the Smurfs live in a forest in Belgium, I can't think of anywhere more unusual than Belgium. The next two, seven out of every ten people fantasize about getting rubbed out or rubbed in, depending on what parts you have, by somebody that's not their partner. And then finally, more than half of everybody in the survey fantasized about having a bit of a romp with somebody famous. And if there's anyone more famous than Smurfette, then I'm fucked if I know who they are. 
Okay, so let's math all that together. What you have without any chemical intervention is a 7.2 in 10 chance of realising every man's fantasy. You can fuck a smurf. All you need is an honest conversation, some blue body paint, and a 30 quid easy jet flight to Brussels. And no matter what you do, please don't be shagging random smurfs at Comic-Con. But if you do, stop before you get blue in the face. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Michael Hutchins from Inexcess. Okay, let's just leave that playing, actually, while we do some feedback. Why not? Okay, so I've got an email this week from Dave in Derby, and he says, Jason, love the idea about the co-host competition thing that you're about doing. I can't help feeling a little left out. Why are you narrowing it down to just the listeners who tweet? Please spare a thought for us antisocial Facebook and Twitter haters that still think that social network is a pint down the pub with a few mates. I don't tweet, I don't give a toss about what's trending, and I refuse to give a shit about what one of my so-called friends had for breakfast, even if he has posted accompanying photos. I do realise that I'm probably in the minority. Sad though, that is. But please don't forget about us. Cheers, Dave from Derby. Dave, thank you and you are absolutely right. So, what I'm planning on doing is a live show. Now, a little while off, I still need to get some text sorted out. But what I want to do, get that text sorted out. And I'll probably actually stream this live as well uh, directly to YouTube or something like that. I'll have Andy and some other guests in the house, and what I'll do is an open Skype line so that people can call in. To start off with, I'll only give the Skype details to the competition winner, who will be announced soon, and Dave and a few others that have been very supportive over the past few months. And then, assuming everything works out properly, I'll open that Skype line up. Now, I know it's a bit risky, but it could be fun. But like I said... I need to sort out some tech and get the gear for that, but it's coming soon. And if that works out, it might be a regular thing. Now, also, just before I go, a quick note. I am at QED all next weekend, including Friday. So episode 36, maybe later. I might do it in two parts, so I'm not too sure. Maybe some pre-recorded stuff during the week and a bit of a QED special later in the week. Or if I can get the equipment into Manchester with me, I might do some recordings at night after the conference. So something completely different, maybe. If you have an opinion on what you prefer, let me know. You know how to get in touch. Now, I'm not at QED in any official manner, apart from um, some volunteering for, for some stuff during the day. But I'm not there representing Skeptic Smash Talk or anything like that. Quite rightly, I'm not that important. But if you're there and you recognize me and you want to come and say hello, I'm not hard to miss. Just look out for that massive dude. I'm about six foot two. I look like an albino Incredible Hulk with that sexy deep voice. And it's a 50-50 chance if you go up to somebody who matches that description, it's probably me. Now, don't forget that I also have Asperger's, so I won't be any good with any of the social clues. So just feel free to come over and say hi, introduce yourself, and we can have a chat. So that being said, that's enough for the week. Don't forget that you can listen directly from the show website, and that's at skepticsmashtalk.com. You can listen from the front page where the the last three main shows will be, and if you hit the blog link, you can find all the past shows and all the show notes are there. The top of the page, you can see all the contact information for Twitter and Facebook and the email, it's all there. Also, if you have a particular podcatcher app that you prefer and this stream is not working, let me know. It really generally is just a very easy fix. It's not happened for a while, but I got an email the other day, somebody having some problems with Stitcher. That's all sorted out now. And finally, for today, thanks to everybody that's been supporting the show. If you also want to help the show, please go to iTunes or your favorite podcaster app and leave some reviews and continue to share the show details on all of your favorite social networks and keep those emails and kind words coming in. Right, 
That's enough from me, and on behalf of Andy from his sick bed and from myself, good night, thank you, and until next time, this has been Skeptic Smash Talk. Okay, so Michael Hutchins from In Excess died when he tried out a little bit of erotic asphyxiation. So his face probably went blue. So it's okay to laugh because it was a long time ago. Oh, and there was a rumour that Kylie Minogue was there with Matt at the time. Absolutely no evidence of this, but she's small like a smurf. So there's that. Good night. (laughs) 